Today's video is about this. Well, it's not just about this, but also the discourse surrounding this. In fact, it's not even just about this, or the discourse surrounding this, but rather what this, and the discourse surrounding this, tells us about modern day England. At this point, about 50% of you who are terminally online will know exactly what this is, and the remaining 50% of you who rely on me for all of your information regarding the news and current affairs, and are therefore incredibly well informed, are probably wondering what on earth I'm talking about, whether I've got the wrong image, and how this could possibly merit an entire video, national discourse, or possibly tell us anything whatsoever about England, beyond what a small bit of one of their two kits will look like, at Euro 2024. This is the New England Home shirt, which went on sale this week, along with the rest of the England Home, Away and Goalkeeper kits, ahead of this summer's Euros. And it would be fair to say that it's caused a bit of a storm. Not because it's £125 for the already sold out match shirt, or £85 for the stadium version. No, 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 that would be much too reasonable. But because of this. What is this, I hear you ask? Why? That's the England flag, of course, silly. The St. George's Cross. Or is it? Well, Nike says that it is, describing it as, quote, a playful update to the flag of St. George on the platform previously known as Twitter. However, it was that exact tweet, highlighting the tiny detailing to the collar of the England home shirt, which incensed some users of the platform which is owned by Elon Musk. The cause of their outrage, well, that was a little bit more scattered. Some claimed that any alteration to the flag of St. George constituted defacing or even desecrating a national symbol. Meanwhile, others projected a whole raft of different causes onto the tiny little flag. There were those who felt that it must be some kind of LGBT symbol or propaganda, despite only featuring three of the six colors from the original rainbow flag, and even fewer from more recent iterations. Then attention turned to the idea that the flag had something to do with transgenderism, because, hey, what can't be blamed on trans people these days? I still hold them responsible for Beckham's missed penalty at Euro 2004, and Rooney's red card against Portugal, even though the colours bear almost zero resemblance to the transgender flag. Next up, it was England's black players who were suddenly responsible and in the firing line, because those must be the colours of some kind of anti-racism flag, that no one knows about, but that one didn't really seem to stick before attention returned to LGBT people, and it was decided that this was definitely, without a doubt, the flag of St. George being turned into the bisexual flag. You know, the bisexual flag. Don't tell me you're not familiar with the bisexual flag. It's the one that all the bisexuals wear, and have for years been lobbying the FA and various kit manufacturers to incorporate into an England flag on the England shirt. I mean, why stop at projecting one woke cause onto what I really must emphasise is a tiny little detail on the New England shirt, when you can simply project all of them onto it? One of the greatest minds of our time, the England legend Joey Barton, who racked up one cap during an illustrious 12-minute career with the Three Lions, made a rare intervention on Twitter, where he sometimes spends as little as 18 hours a day, tweeting, quote, they know exactly what they are doing, at Nike, at FA, at England. Trying to sneak that woke, gay, communist nonsense onto the England national team jersey. It'll be to appease all of the lesbians who play for the at Lionesses and in women's football. Nothing playful about it. Another manoeuvre in their attempted coup d'etat of the men's game. Leave our flag and our game alone. End quote. Yes, that's right, it's the lesbians what done it. I always suspected them, to be honest. The woke, gay, communist lesbians in the England women's team. First they let women play football, then they let them be lesbians, and now they're letting them carry out their big, gay, communist, lesbian coup d'etat of the men's game. Honestly, it's enough to make you sick. Barton might have thought that he'd uncovered the whole plot, but not even the unique mind of a man who has twice been convicted of violent assault and once described Brazil's future all-time leading goalscorer as being, quote, cat piss, could get to the bottom of this riddle wrapped inside a mystery, inside an enigma. Thankfully, this Nottingham Forest fan, whose identity I have protected because I wouldn't want MI5 or the CIA getting to him, 
he knows too much, did what can only be described as a macro analysis, digging deep down into the history of both flags and the discourse, no doubt speaking to numerous vexillographers and vexillophiles, and coming to the conclusion that, and I quote, well, I'm reading it's a cross between LGBT b****s and her shit, but f knows. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, mystery solved. The Football Association and Nike, in accordance with Gareth Southgate, after being lobbied by England's black players and all of the lesbians and communists in the women's team, came up with the idea of desecrating the flag of St. George, and with it, if we're being honest, the great name of this nation as a whole, by putting a tiny little detail on the collar of a shirt that England will wear in about half of their games for the next two years, in order to promote LGBT and Hamas. Now what, I ask you, is so hard to believe about any of that? Yes, no, I, I know, it's outrageous. What do you mean, why would they do any of that? No, I don't specifically know who the communists are in the England women's team. Probably Beth Mead. How does it promote Hamas or the LGBT community? Jesus Christ, were you born yesterday? Well, no, all right. I don't know exactly. They're probably going to use the proceeds from the sale of the kits to build tunnels in Gaza and to fund the medical transition of children. Why else would it cost 125 quid? Jeez, what's with all the questions? Anyone would think that you're not finding the communist Hamas lesbian theory very compelling. For what it's worth, even though that is obviously true, and I don't know why anyone wouldn't believe it, in the interest of balance, because I'm nothing if not scrupulously fair, I should point out that both the FA and Nike, when they first unveiled the kit and following the subsequent backlash, have denied that the design was inspired by lesbianism, homosexuality, transsexuality, bisexuality, anti-white racism, communism or wokeism. But then again, they would say that, wouldn't they? Nike, in their segment describing that aspect of the kit when they unveiled it, stated, quote, The England 2024 home kit disrupts history with a modern take on a classic. The trim on the cuffs takes its cues from the training gear worn by England's 1966 heroes with a gradient of blues and reds topped with purple. The same colours also feature an interpretation of the flag of St. George on the back of the collar. End quote. Uh, hang on a minute. Do these guys really expect us to believe that the detailing on an England kit, which was always advertised as being a modern interpretation of a retro design, features the colours from an iconic piece of England clothing from the national team's greatest ever achievement, rather than being a plot by communists and non-whites to undermine Western values? Honestly, they must think that we were born yesterday. The FA also defended the decision, in slightly blunter and less corporate terms, stating simply that it, quote, isn't the first time that different colours have been used. As if that makes things better. It turns out that the bisexual Hamas communists have been in our midst even longer than we first thought. Again, just for what it's worth, it is technically true that the colours, and indeed the design of the England flag, have been changed before. In fact, Contrary to popular opinion, the England flag is rarely featured on England shirts at all, dating all the way back to the 1800s, and when it has done, it has almost always been edited in some way, whether that be in terms of the shape or colours. Just in case you don't believe me, here is the England goalkeeping kit from 2011, which, unlike the new kit, features reimagined England flags very prominently, rather than just as a tiny detail, in this case in various shades of green, presumably in some kind of support for the state of East Sumatra, even though it had ceased to exist in 1950, or maybe it was the work of the abrosexuals that time. Hey, look, it's just a theory. I haven't consulted an expert like Joey just yet, but there are definite similarities. Another goalkeeping kit from 2012 featured a white cross on a blue background, or, as I prefer to call it, a deportation offence and a personal insult to our Royal Highness King Charles III, I believe that one was a powerful gesture in solidarity with Scotland, following their failure to qualify for Euro 2012, but again, I could be wrong. And of course, who could possibly forget, except for absolutely everyone it seems, England's home shirt from 2011 featured a reimagining of the flag of St. George in not one, not two, not even three, but four different colours, which, if you ask me, ought to add up to four separate whole life sentences. Admittedly, 
one of the four colors of the tiny flags was red, so you can probably chalk that one off, but blue, green, and purple? What is this? The gay men's pride flag? Ironically, unlike the New England kit, the 2011 kit was designed to convey a message, and yes, if you really want to use that word, could even be described as woke. Factory Records co-founder Peter Saville, who designed album covers for iconic British groups like Joy Division, New Order and Pulp, was the man behind the 2011 England kits, and he spoke openly about the intention behind the shirts that he designed. Saville said that he felt as though the England flag had been devalued in recent decades by being associated with a particular kind of nationalism, which was confrontational and sometimes violent. And by making the flag such a prominent part of the England shirt, an unusual move in of itself, he felt as though it could somehow be rehabilitated and embraced by all of England. Now, brace yourselves, because... This is where things get really woke, except no one called it woke in 2011. It was called political correctness, which was exactly the same thing, but with a different name. Except no one even called it that, because the culture wars weren't quite as insane at the time. Savile said that the idea behind using multiple different colours for the flag on the England shirt was to represent the diversity of modern England. I know. Imagine if Nike and the FA had said that now. Aliens could literally land on Earth and tell us a planetary-ending event was only days away from us, and the Daily Mail would still have led with that instead. Savile said that he would have made the flag of St. George in a million different colours if he had been given that opportunity, with the intention that it would be something that, and I quote, a diverse cross-section of society could identify with. Now that, personally, I don't have any issue with. I quite like that England kit. But that could be described as being political, progressive, woke, etc, etc, whatever you want to call it. And yet, if you are able to cast your minds back to 2011, a gargantuan 13 years ago, back when the likes of Joe Hart, Wayne Rooney and Danny Welbeck still played for England, presumably in black and white, I can't be sure, I can't remember that far back, there was no outrage, no Twitter storm, no wall-to-wall -wall newspaper and television coverage, no petitions or protests, and no queue of politicians from all three of the country's major parties lining up to demand that the sanctity of the flag of St. George be respected, and no, if you are watching this overseas, I'm not joking, that the kit actually be remade to amend the little flag on the back of the collar. So what changed? Why is an England flag in different colours on the England shirt in 2024, designed to pay homage to England's iconic training jacket from the 1966 World Cup, and to be in keeping with the rest of the kit, cause for a moral panic and countless op-eds about wokeness, but an England flag in different colours on the England shirt in 2011, designed, explicitly, to detoxify the flag and make it appeal to a more diverse cross-section of society, received about as much attention as my video on the best footballer with every size boots. Honestly, you should watch it. How else are you going to find out who is the best player with size 15 flippers? Well, much like Copernicus just before his death, back in the mid-1500s, I have a theory. You see, the United Kingdom, but England especially, is a nation at war. That's it. Yes, it's war. Not a conventional war, biological war, or a nuclear war. No, it is something much more sinister than any of that. It is a culture war. It's a war which, not incidentally might I add, suits the nation's media ecosystem very well, and the concocted England kit flag row is a perfect illustration of how the outrage machine works. First, the England kit is released. People say whether they like it or not, as is always the case, this part is normal, and then crack on with the rest of their day because... who cares? Then, Knight tweets about the flag detailing, crucially, using the words unite and inspire. That part is important because the language, unite and inspire, which, and this in of itself is a bit bonkers, has become sort of left or progressive coded in recent years, is just about the only plausible explanation as to why anyone would think that the flag on the collar of the England shirt was some kind of activism or attached to a cause in any way, shape or form. Interestingly, Knight did the exact same post on Instagram, but with a different caption, which simply read, a modern interpretation of the St. George flag, and there was no outrage in response. Now, I suspect that is partly because Instagram is just 
a bit more normal compared to Twitter, and by that, I mean that people are a little bit more well-adjusted, but primarily, that is because of the different captions. It should be said, I don't think the detailing will unite or inspire anyone, any more than I think that it was meant to represent Hamas or transgenderism. It is just dull corporate jargon, typical of a mega corporation like Nike. Nor, however, do I think that it is rational that, in the year of our Lord 2024, the words unite and inspire in of themselves, accompanied by a tiny flag with some colours in it, should immediately prompt a trauma response in anyone because they automatically assume that they're being assaulted by wokeism. Anyway, there are a small number of people whose brains work like that and, well, after seeing the Unite and Inspire tweet, inevitably, they were united in their collective indignation and inspired to take to Twitter to make sure that everyone was well aware of their anger and condemnation and to share with the world their theories as to what this sinister symbol, the flag of St. George but in different colours, something which has obviously never been done before, could possibly mean. If this is where things stopped, the organic outrage of a small number of terminally online weirdos, and I don't think that is being too unkind, who have invented something in their own heads and then got really incensed about it, it wouldn't really be much of an issue. There have always, and will always, be people like that. There were probably a small handful of people in 2011 who were equally outraged about the different coloured flags on that shirt, and you know what? If you're someone who believes that the flag of St. George is some sacred thing which ought never be altered, and you are consistent in that belief, I think that you are probably a bit odd, but fair enough, I can respect that, and feel free to go off about the little flag on the collar of the New England shirt. If you're someone who thinks that daubing the name of your football club, town, or whatever else on an England flag, which is basically the dictionary definition of defacing something, as thousands of England fans do at every England game and major tournaments, quite frankly, you haven't got a leg to stand on. Of course, there are far more people, myself included, who are perfectly fine with that, and I would argue sincerely, and I'm not just being flippant, that defacing the England flag is therefore an important part of our national identity and culture, and that the New England kit is therefore reflecting a unique part of English culture, and what it means to be an England fan. Bravo Nike and the FA, that is what true patriotism looks like. Seriously though, outside of Britain, which other countries do this? I've been to lots of international football matches and tournaments, and it is a very English thing. I mean, surely, we must be the only country whose fans write the name of the country, England, emblazoned in all caps across the middle of... an England flag, as though that wasn't already implied, and Johnny Foreigner might still be left in any confusion, as to who you support. I am mocking it, and it is silly and weird, but that is an important part of English identity, being slightly eccentric and daft. The point being, however, that if the outrage ended there, not just in this story, but in thousands of others that are churned out day after day after day, most people would never even have noticed the flag on the collar of the England shirt, and if they did, they probably wouldn't have any strong feelings about it because, well, it's a tiny flag on the collar of a football shirt. Instead, in 2024, what happens is that journalists, who used to be people who went out and investigated things, reported on them, and informed the public, before their bosses decided that that was far too expensive an endeavour, and informing the public didn't actually serve their interests very well, now trawl social media in search of a few outraged people, who aren't remotely reflective of any demographic, but have grievances which can fit neatly into a broader narrative, which is painted literally every day in almost every major newspaper in England, and they amplify those voices onto a national level as though they were national stories. Just take this, the back page of the Daily Mail on Friday. The headline reads, Fury over England's woke kit, with the subheading stating, quote, Fans outraged as Nike and FA turned St. George's cross purple and blue. The preview for the story goes on to state, quote, there was widespread fury on Thursday over England's controversial new shirt, which features an altered version of the St. George's cross on the collar. The FA and manufacturers Nike doubled down on the design, insisting that they have no plans to recall the jersey. Nike described the navy, light blue and purple colours as a playful update on the nation's flag. They say that the changed kit is not virtue signalling, but instead a nod to the 1966 World Cup winners. 
Fans and commentators disagree and have reacted angrily since the release of the kit, which England will wear at Euro 2024 this summer, branding it woke and dumb. No other country would allow this to happen, said Mail Sport columnist Simon Jordan. End quote. Okay, so let's just very briefly deconstruct that, shall we? Of course, there is nothing sensationalist about fury over England's woke kit, that is a fair and balanced way, in which to introduce the topic to your readers, but fair enough, there was some fury among some people, but the real telltale sign of the slate of hand that is being played right off the bat is the fact that the word woke sits inside of two apostrophes. Now, this is a little trick that the press like to play whereby, by sticking something inside of quotation marks or inverted commas, so long as someone, somewhere, and it can literally be anyone has said something, you can print it and present it as absolute fact. Now, if there was any evidence, literally any at all, that the England kit was in any way, shape, or form woke, you'd better believe that the Daily Mail wouldn't be putting it in quotation marks, they'd be shouting it from the rooftops and explaining why it was the case. The reality, however, as we've already established, is that, and as the authors of that piece, the newspaper's editors, and most likely the headline writer all well know, there isn't a shred of evidence to suggest that that is the case. You might wonder, therefore, if the Daily Mail and their staff sought to inform their readers why they would lead with something which is, and which they know to be, basically fiction, to which the answer, of course, is that they have absolutely no intention of informing their readers. Nine times out of ten, in fact, their aim is the precise opposite. The subheading then states, Fans outraged as Nike and FA turn St. George's Cross purple and blue which is drummed home in the body of the article by phrases like widespread fury and fans and commentators disagree and have reacted angrily since the release of the kit, which England will wear at Euro 2024 this summer, branding it woke and dumb. The intention here is very transparent and, since I assume most of my audience is fairly media literate, I probably don't have to explain it to you. Just in case, however, the language employed by the Daily Mail is designed to portray a very one-dimensional narrative whereby England fans are one homogenous group, they are all outraged, and think that the kit is woke and dumb. This is the view of England fans. Which England fans? Well, I've been to over 50 England games, three major tournaments, and will be in Germany for an entire month supporting England for as long as they're still in the Euros, I'd hope that qualifies me as an England fan. I must admit, I wasn't furious and didn't think that it was woke or dumb, nor was my dad who started taking me to games when I was a kid, and who some of you will remember from my vlogs at the last Euros, and nor did any of my friends who were coming to the Euros in Germany this summer, so... Clearly not those fans, no, it's the angry ones on Twitter.com who think that it is a lesbian Hamas plot, who were furious and thought that it was woke and dumb, and do you know what? If the small flag in the collar of the England shirt was in fact a lesbian Hamas symbol, I would probably agree with them. That would be a little bit weird, wouldn't it? The Daily Mail has the opportunity, therefore, to inform those people, and set the record straight, that their fury is baseless. But instead, it presents their misconception as being the prevailing, and indeed, the only view of England fans, while simultaneously dismissing the idea that it might not be woke or dumb. And then, having claimed that this is so widespread and ubiquitous among England fans, the source that the Daily Mail actually cites is... Simon Jordan, the former Crystal Palace chairman turned TalkSport shock jock, who is paid by the Daily Mail as well as TalkSport to parrot reactionary talking points and perpetuate misinformation and outrage. As I said, I could give a million examples, from the back and the front pages, but that one is almost too perfect of an example. Absolute chef's kiss. Three cheers for the Daily Mail. Hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, hip hip Hurrah for the black shirts. Ah oh, yes, the Daily Mail support for the Nazis, who went on to kill almost half a million Brits in World War II, and millions of others. Now let's return to their lecture on British values. It's not just the Daily Mail, of course. The Sun, amusingly, who have slammed the New England shirt, claiming that fans are furious and that it erases our history, also named the 2011 England home shirt, which features the flag in several different colours, as the fifth greatest England shirt of all time. 
But hey, I'm sure that these are all deeply held beliefs. After all, that was almost 18 months ago. Surely we're all entitled to completely change our value systems within a matter of months to whip our readers up into a manufactured frenzy. Say what you want about the sun at the end of the day, they might be inconsistent in some of their views, but they themselves were never to face an England fla- Oh, for crying out loud. This is the way that the media meat grinder works in modern day Britain. There is a central thesis, and if you think that this sounds too simplistic, you're right, but it is their narrative that is simplistic, not my explanation of it, which is that dangerous outsiders, principally ethnic minorities, and anyone to the left of Jacob Rees-Mogg, are working in tandem to undermine British values, trademark, posing a grave risk to you and your family's way of life, and then... Every story, no matter how big or small, goes through the meat grinder and comes out at the other end as, surprise, surprise, only serving to emphasise that central thesis. I am telling you, pick up almost any newspaper in England on almost any day of the week, open up any random page, and ask yourself whether this process has happened. Nine times out of ten, I can guarantee you that it has. And on the tenth, you've probably stumbled upon an advert. Again, even this wouldn't be that much of a problem, I mean, it is quite insidious, but not that many people buy newspapers now, and even the sizable online audience is dwarfed by online media and other forms of content, were it not for the power that these publications wield when it comes to shaping the national discourse. You can watch, in real time, the newspapers in this country launch and torpedo the entire careers of politicians with consummates. In 2019, around the clock media blitzkrieg played a vital role in winning former Daily Telegraph, The Spectator, and current Daily Mail journalist Boris Johnson an enormous majority, but as soon as Johnson took liberties with the press and began to embarrass them, they put him back in his box. Suddenly, they started noticing things, whether that be the expenses scandal, lockdown breaches, or the fact that several of his MPs were perverts, and within weeks, maybe months, Johnson was gone. You see, the newspapers in this country don't actually have to be read in order to control the conversation. Rupert Murdoch's newspaper The Sun actually runs at an enormous loss, which ought to prompt the question, why does he still own and fund it? Most of the major television networks in the United Kingdom literally start each day with a segment called This Morning's Papers, where they reel off the newspaper headlines and stories, inevitably, therefore, driving home the same narrative. It is for that reason that Nigel Farage, Lee Anderson, Keir Starmer, and Rishi Sunak, or, as I prefer to call it, the world's worst dinner party, are all firmly in agreement that the little England flag on the collar of the New England shirt is a scandal which must be rectified, despite the fact that, deep down, none of them care. Seriously, they couldn't care less. Most of these people are either ambivalent about football or actively despise it. The outrage is almost entirely manufactured, and when I say almost, the only caveat is the tiny number of people who grumbled when they saw that tweet by Nike before the newspapers started to run with it. They tell you what to think, when, why, and what you should be outraged about, and then establish norms that are supposedly sacrosanct, even though they've only just invented them, and then pillage those who have violated their new rules. Again, just take the story about the England shirt. The supposed norm that has been violated here, and therefore you should be enraged, is the flag of St. George being altered. Ignore the fact that what they're actually referring to is the England flag, which is itself an adaptation of the flag of St. George. Oh, and the fact that the England flag rarely features on the England kit, and when it first did, on the 1998 away kit, it was adapted and wasn't in the right colours, nor was it in 2004, 2006, 2011, oh, and well... Uh, that's every time, looks like it's always adapted and this was a big moral panic. As we've established, the idea that the England flag is sacred and must be undisturbed is disproven by virtually every England fan that takes a flag to a tournament or game, and likewise, the argument that has repeatedly been made, including by everyone's least favourite unflushable turd, Simon Jordan, that kit manufacturers wouldn't dare do this to any other national team, only England because we're so weak and woke, we won't even slaughter anyone for daring to alter our flag, on a tiny detailing on a football shirt is, well, 
It's also nonsense. The Brazil and Scotland shirts in recent years have both had adaptations of their own flag on their kit, as have, I would imagine, a hundred other countries. If I could be bothered to look, and if Scotland and Brazil, neither of whom went into a total meltdown when it happened, didn't already illustrate my point. From there, they will pivot to, do you think they'd do this to Saudi Arabia or the Russia shirt? Well... I don't know, to be honest. I guess Russia hasn't got much use for a national football shirt at the moment. But assuming that they wouldn't, surely it's a good thing that we are more tolerant and less unhinged about the supposed sanctity of our flag than a literal theocratic dictatorship that slaughters dissidents and a totalitarian kleptocracy where political opponents have a nasty habit of falling out of eighth-story windows. It should also be said that the England flag having any significant association with the England football team, not just the kit but the fans themselves, is an extremely recent phenomenon, rather than some kind of ancient tradition. Go back and watch clips or entire England games from tournaments prior to Euro 92, including when England won the World Cup on home soil of course in 1966, and you'll find hardly any England flags. Resoundingly, the flag that was associated with the England team, unusually might I add, was the Union flag, the flag of the entire United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Why this started to change at Euro 92 and had undergone a full transformation by Euro 96, no one seems to be quite sure. One theory is that England drawing Scotland in the group stage at Euro 96 made the Union flag feel inappropriate as a representation of solely the England team, along with a surge in Scottish nationalism which led to devolution. That may go some way towards explaining it, but not why it began in 92 or why it was so ubiquitous by 96. Another idea that I've seen suggested, which seems preposterous to me, but it is amusing nonetheless, is that English people had lots of Union flags lying around from the celebrations at the end of World War II and Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953, but by the 1990s, a younger generation of England fan, without Union flags lying around, had started to attend games. Heck, Maybe the real reason is because the England flag is so much easier than the Union flag to deface by writing and sticking other logos and symbols on it. Who knows? But what we do know for sure is that the England flag being synonymous with the England team is extremely recent and ought to be about as sacred, were it not for the press convincing everyone otherwise, as the new Juventus logo is to Juventus fans. Within my lifetime, and I'm really not that old yet, less than three decades, displaying the national flag outside of major sporting and civil events has gone from being viewed, at best, as a bit garish, tacky, and, with the greatest of respect to any American viewers, a bit like something that the Americans would do, reflecting a younger nation with a lack of self-confidence and self-assurance. As anyone over the age of about 25 and with a memory longer than a goldfish will attest, that was the way in which it was seen. Politicians didn't constantly drape themselves in the Union flag or plaster it all over their campaign literature, outside of the National Front of course, in order to virtue signal their supposed patriotism. It would have been considered bizarre. They treated voters and the public like adults and communicated using their words at a time when we were, in some ways at least, more advanced than chimpanzees. The same is true of remembrance. When I was growing up, not all that long ago, remembrance was a quiet, solemn period of, well, remembrance. It was about never forgetting the folly of war, the young men who tragically lost their lives because of the madness, ambition, and twisted ideas of leaders, and the fear, pain, and suffering that they went through. Personally, I would always think of my late granddad's brother, who died at the age of only 20 during World War II, when his plane went down. My grandfather, who found out via telegram, lived to be in his 90s. And the contrast between their two lives, the fullness of life that my granddad got to live, and the lifetime that was stolen from his brother, and the brother that was therefore stolen from my granddad, was and still is quite a profound thought to me. And then you put it in perspective that 60 million other people were also robbed of their lives, and many more of relatives, during World War II alone. Maybe you wore a poppy on Remembrance Sunday, or for one day at school, or maybe you just made a small donation. But it was a tiny part of Remembrance. Now Remembrance has been entirely redefined. It's no longer a time for solemn, quiet, and meaningful personal reflection. 
The poignance has been lost, replaced instead by cheap, tacky memorabilia, and a constant inquest to make sure that everyone everywhere is wearing a poppy for an entire month and labelling them as treasonous if they don't. And this is portrayed as being the norm, some kind of ancient tradition of glittery poppies and bombastic pride, as though remembrance were about remembering who won the war and how great war is, rather than the people who were lost, the suffering that was caused, and how truly awful it is. On the same day that the Mail Online led with the supposed fury over the little flag on the collar of England's new kit, the DWP released statistics showing that child poverty in the United Kingdom had reached an all-time high since records began. 4.3 million, over half, 2.2 million, live in food-secure households and are forced to skip meals. I suppose that just wasn't as newsworthy as the little flag on the collar of England's new kit. It's easy to laugh at Peter Shilton, a man who wore the England shirt more times than anyone else, capped 125 times, going on BBC Radio 5 Live to complain about the New England kit and claiming that, quote, England represents our country and red, white and blue are the colours that we have on our flag. Are they really, Peter? Are you 100% sure about that? Or Jamie O'Hara claiming that every time he represented England as a schoolboy to under 21 level, he felt united and inspired because he was wearing a shirt that had his national flag on it, despite the fact that most of the England shirts O'Hara wore never had an England flag on them, and the ones that did were all reimagined and artistically redesigned, and there were more Walker's Crisps logos on them than there were actual England flags, because it is funny to laugh at stupid people saying increasingly unhinged and mental things. But the reality is that this isn't about the England kit or a few idiots. Well, I mean, it is, isn't it? But it is more than that. It's a symptom of a media ecosystem that is rotten to its very core, has an iron grip over our politics, and therefore ensures that, as has been the case throughout my entire adult life, and indeed beyond, things in this country have two perpetual states, stagnation and decline. And even the idea that anything could ever improve is considered laughable and unrealistic. When our politicians and newspaper columnists talk about national identity, national pride, or the fabric of England and the United Kingdom, it is a shame that they are invariably referring to literal fabric, bits of cloth, political posturing and symbols rather than real wages, which haven't risen in 15 years, child poverty being at all-time highs, high streets which look like ghost towns deserted due to nuclear disasters, slow, unreliable, and unaffordable public transports, and the total erosion of the social fabric, the idea that people should be able to get on in life, afford to buy their own home, and give their children a better life than their own. But hey, the Little England flag on the collar of the New England shirt could have been woke. It wasn't in the end, but it could have been. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, it goes without saying by this stage. Make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be about to appear on your screen now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. And you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And there will be links to do all of those things, plus a whole lot more, down in the video description below. Cheers.